Welcome everyone to the NextGen BI webinar for healthcare and life sciences. My name is Oksana Pickerel. I'm the global segment leader for healthcare and life sciences at Amazon Web Services. And I will be a host and moderator for today's presentation. In addition to learning about AWS, we will also hear today from several uh, important partners and customers of ours. Dan Hausman and Patrick Lurch will talk about their work implementing Deloitte's Converge Health Miner, which is a real-world evidence platform for life sciences organizations. And that will be followed by Brad Bostic, uh, along with Michelle Koster and Patty Smith, who will share their experience of deploying hc one customized CRM platform for healthcare organizations. We're tremendously excited to have such a great lineup, lineup of speakers with us today. And uh, what's important is these are the speakers that have real life experience building modern decision support tools for healthcare and life sciences on AWS. So remember to keep those questions coming and to engage. When we talk about next generation business intelligence, we really define it broadly as the increasingly sophisticated set of modern decision support tools and services made especially valuable by our APN partners who bring their deep expertise in healthcare and life sciences to a wide variety of customer organizations. And these can include genomics, biopharma, medtech, payers, and providers. Ultimately, we're all in this business to help improve patient outcomes, both clinical and economic. And the cloud technology is truly transforming our industry by supporting better consumer and business decisions with innovative tools and services. As we all know, many factors can lead to improved patient outcomes, including better patient engagement through new modalities such as uh, health, ease of access to health information via voice, greater connectivity between disparate health and research data repositories, infusion of real-world data into R&D, to design better targeted therapies, as well as improve physician and health administrator decision support tools. All of these components are essential for our ability to deliver impactful and data-driven action, and that's where the cloud is proving to bring value. We all know that we operate in a very conservative and heavily regulated industry, so the numbers here really speak to the growing maturity and acceptance of cloud-based services. Uh, a couple stats um, at the top, a 2017 HIMSS study found that 65% of healthcare organizations were using cloud-based services and nearly 88% of those organizations were utilizing SaaS solutions, which have become a preferred deployment method for many clinical application vendors. And the footprint of data-driven solutions in life sciences is quite significant as well. Both healthcare and life sciences organizations are now using a variety of cloud-based tools to improve their decision-making, including clinical, operational, and risk management decisions, uh, among many others. Industry-specific compliance, um, uh, gratifyingly, is receding as a cloud adoption barrier, so we can now turn our focus towards automated compliance at scale. And that's what enables a broad variety of applications that are aimed at improving patient care and product development for example, by optimizing patient therapy based on the most recent scientific findings or reducing waste by eliminating the use of out-of-date laboratory tests. And those are some of the examples we're going to hear later today. What I'd like to do is really briefly mention a few AWS native services for decision support before we dive into our customer and partner stories. The three AWS services that I like to highlight are Amazon QuickSight, Amazon Macy, and Amazon SageMaker. For clinical and population health analytics, Amazon QuickSight is a fast BI service that makes it easy for you to build visualizations, perform ad hoc analytics, and quickly gain insights from your data, automating many of those analysis tasks. For organizations dealing with sensitive data, as all of ours are, um, Amazon Macy is a security service that is powered by machine learning principles and can be used to discover, classify, and protect your data on AWS. So it's naturally a very useful component for building compliance at scale. And Amazon SageMaker 
is a fully managed service that enables developers and data scientists to quickly and easily build, train, and deploy machine learning models at any scale. So it helps you run production machine learning workloads without having to manage the underlying infrastructure. Our APN partners then build value-adding specialized solutions that are specifically designed for industry verticals such as ours, healthcare and life sciences. And today we have an opportunity to learn from two of our APN partners, both recognized for their industry expertise and AWS know-how by having achieved our healthcare and life sciences competency designations in the, in the AWS partner network, the APN. Deloitte is the creator of the Converge Health Miner real-world evidence platform, and uh, Dan Hausman will co-present uh, with a customer, Patrick Lurch from Celgene first, and that story will be followed by hc1.com and uh, Memorial that will talk about um, the HC1 solution, where HC1 has developed a healthcare-centered customer relationship management CRM system that helps uncover inefficiencies, increase communication between disparate clinical teams, and make better decisions that improve both patient care and the bottom line. And now I would like to introduce Dan Hausman, Consulting Managing Director for Deloitte Converge Health. Dan? Hey, everybody. Um, I just want to quickly give you some background on what we're doing at Deloitte. Most of you know Deloitte as a large-scale professional services company. Um, we found both with cloud technology and also in the space of life sciences that there's been a, a growing demand for prepackaged capabilities that solve very specific broad business needs. Um, one of those areas that has come about in the past few years has been this idea of real-world data and real-world evidence. And it's it's come about because of a lot of pressure from the availability of all the different data sets that have come about from electronic health records, IoT devices, genomics, um, as well as the changing dynamics of how to bring a drug to market. And so when we look at what capabilities our clients were looking for us to package, we put into three different areas. One was in connecting with patients, being able to have a direct layer to collect information from those individuals. Um, the other was on the, the far side of being able to build off of safety to process large-scale signals. And in the middle, we, we call this minor, which was to, to really help gain insights off of the data sets that were being licensed or acquired through partnerships. Um, we've been fortunate to work with Celgene over the past two years, who's one of our early clients of the minor solution um, to, to create the kinds of analytics that I think are useful for all life sciences companies and probably cross over into healthcare as well as some of the disease advocacy groups to look at you know, what drugs work in what context for which patients. Um, originally, a lot of the groups we were working with were interested in simply solving some of their infrastructure challenges to scale out of on-premise systems, increasing costs of database appliances. Um, but we found um, in the past couple of years is that it's been more of a strategic shift that's driving their investment in this area, both to be able to get to um, execution on advanced machine learning and learn more from information than they could in the past. So they're, they're looking to apply these tools um, as well as to use sort of the supply chain of information and be able to rapidly be able to engage with the data providers in a much more closer partnership than has been operating in the past to get at the information that's critical to drive business decisions. Um, overall, working with the AWS platform, uh, as well as a number of different tools we can bring into the package solutions and the custom capabilities we put together, we've been able to look at the areas that are of high complexity that would normally take maybe weeks to operate and reduce those kinds of transactions to, to days, if not hours. And the end benefit for clients has been now they can investigate many different areas of interest rapidly um, and be able to support what, what grows like all data projects is the increasing demand to get answers out of the information they've already put into um, investments within their organization. 
Um, I'd like to introduce Patrick Lurch, and he can give you greater detail on, on the project at Celgene called IQ. And, uh, you know, happy to be working with Celgene on these initiatives. Thank you, Dan. So as Dan mentioned, my name is Patrick Lurch. I lead a group within Celgene called Data Sciences. We're a cross-organizational group supporting um, analytics all the way from you know, early preclinical target ID all the way through into commercial. Um, this slide just provides high-level overview. We sit within a larger organization um, called Information Knowledge Utilization, pronounced IQ, and we're, I think at its, at its core, we're really tasked with transforming the way that Celgene thinks about, manages, um, and importantly, anticipates its key data needs. Um, and this is what I'll talk about today and how we leverage uh, the platform that we co-created with Deloitte. So um, in particular, um, interest is the identified patient data sets, which drive decisions really across the entire pharmaceutical pipeline. So what I show here is um, just a very high level diagram of the pipeline across the top. Each of the horizontal bars represent different groups that are actively leveraging real world data and um, in order to make decisions um, and, and really progress medicines through the pipeline. I think a key stage for us as a pharmaceutical company really starts um, around phase one, um, phase one through phase three, where um, information on our product starts entering the external landscape. I think as, as most people here probably know, you know, pharmaceutical companies are one of the few organizations in healthcare that do not have access to real world healthcare data as a result of the way in which um, we do business. So the moment one of our medicines is introduced into the clinic, um, every other stakeholder, every other customer and patients know more about sort of the real world efficacy um, of our medicines than, than we do. So historically speaking, to fill in this gap, what pharmaceutical companies have relied on is really sort of the in-licensing of data. So just depicted here, once again, you have the pharmaceutical pipeline across the middle. You'll notice um, a lot of vertical slides or arrows in this slide. Um, it's a lot of different groups in licensing data. What you will notice historically uh, within pharma is very few arrows going left to right. Um, so we had a a lot of content being in licensed from across the organization. However, because of our size, because of our geographic footprint, um, it is very difficult to um, know whether another group is in licensing a given claims data set or has a partnership with a specific hospital to get ac access to abstracted chart data. Um, so what, what we found, Prior to, I think, engaging um, with Deloitte is you, you had a lot of redundancy um, and, and oftentimes, and I've seen this at other pharma that I've worked with and heard other colleagues at other pharma discuss this, you know, sometimes even to the point of, of not even knowing that you had a partnership with another organization until you actually approach that organization uh, and they let you know. Um, so working now with synapse in place which is what what we refer to as the platform with deloitte we're we're putting a halt to sort of this cycle um, and we're developing what we call a data footprint um, so the graphic that's represented here is, is what we would call sort of an operational data footprint so along the um, vertical axis you know each, each row here refers to a different type of data set um, along both the left and the right side, I've highlighted where different groups are you know, in parallel and in some cases um, unaware um, are actually leveraging the data sets to make decisions across the company. And then the different columns here actually represent key attributes of each of these real world healthcare data sets um, that are important. So what this very quickly allows us to to realize is what is important to different parts of the organization in terms of driving decisions so 
for instance, within a lot of the commercial parts of the organization, um, what is really key is the refresh rate of the data set. Um, also in clinical trial recruitment, um, you know, ideally we have daily refreshes on a given data set. Whereas within like a health economics or an outcomes research perspective, the recency of the data is not necessarily as important as ensuring that the data covers the appropriate breadth of the population. So it's representative of a diabetic population or a multiple myeloma population, or if you're asking a question about a specific geography, it's representative of that specific geography. Um, this view is very useful for us to make sure that people are aware of what data sets exist. And as we encounter an opportunity to engage with a new data source, we can assess where it fits in relative to what we already have in place. Um, in regards to um, use of sort of the data footprint concept um, around the core business, what this slide here shows, um, so once again, along the vertical axis are the different disease areas. And then along the top, you have different years. So this represents, um, and the bars within each cell represent the number of patients where we have information on a specific therapeutic area within that year. So using this view, we can very quickly get an assessment of um, what, what does our data, corporate data assets look like. Um, and this is extremely useful as medicines are reaching different stages within the pipeline. And we know that we're going to need to do certain types of real world studies um, in specific geographies. We can begin to anticipate where we have a gap. And then in order to fill those gaps, we actually reach out and cultivate a network of data partners. Um, so these are data, really partnerships in the truest meaning of the word um, that we work. Um, this is a subset of the partners. We work with these partners to reach out in specific therapeutic area, ensure that we developed um, very broad and deep data assets um, uh, in a number of areas. Oops, let me go back one slide. So just touching on the platform that is required um, to really accomplish this. So um, you really do require a platform that covers sort of the end-to-end -end functionality of, of data science. So starting at the very top, you, know, you need the data catalog and the search. You need to know what data assets exist. Um, you know, just sort of following that down, you need the data centrally stored. A number of these, or every one of these data sets has legal requirements uh, for patient level data. The patient data is consented for a specific purpose. So the platform allows us to manage all of that governance um, across multiple continents. Um, we have the analytics tools. So once you're provided access, you can immediately you know, open up the tool that, um, that you prefer to code in, whether it's R, whether it's Python or SAS. Um, importantly, um, on the next layer, a lot of people talk about data and the importance of data. What's also key here is the knowledge that you gain around the data. So, for instance, how do you define um, how do you define progression in multiple myeloma? It's actually a very complicated algorithm that involves looking specifically at the M spike lab data, looking over a certain period of duration. That's coded into R, Python, or SAS, and that can actually be shared across the organization. And then lastly, you know, the bulk of our stakeholders um, within the organization, they're not data scientists. They don't write code. Um, so having access to Tableau, R Shiny, as well as a whole series of, sort of point and click self-serve applications allows people who perhaps don't know R, they don't know Python, um, to slice and dice. And, and really start digging into the data. So this, the last topic I wanted to cover before turning it over is just one real world example of a study that we conducted. This was presented at ECHO, the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization. Um, this is a very real problem that we face. Um, so this is just you know, within Crohn's disease, wanting to understand based on data from the real world, from healthcare systems, in this case in the US, get an idea of how Crohn's disease is being treated in the real world. So in this case, if you go into the methods and, and these slides will be made available, 
Um, you know, we had a very concise definition of Crohn's disease. Um, we were able to do the analysis in the platform. In this particular case, we used R. Um, this is actually a screenshot of an R shiny plot. So the way to, this is a basic Sankey diagram. The way to read this is the vertical axis is Crohn's, the number of patients. Um, the horizontal axis shows the different lines of treatment. So in this case, you have 16,260 Crohn's disease patients. 42% of those are treated with corticosteroids. And then if you had access to the interactive R shiny script, you could actually drill down into each of these treatment pathways. And this really allows, once again, those people who aren't data scientists who don't know how to program, you know, we can build an analysis, we can throw it into R shiny, and then they can access it, slice it and dice it and use it within their decision making process. So to close, um, as I mentioned, you know, changing healthcare landscape in particular for pharma requires us to become much more data-driven organizations as a whole and to really pay attention and to help evolve those data sources and the channels that we use to get access to data. Um, I think, you know, as in other industries, you know, the IT and the information platforms, you know, need to encourage data access and sharing, but also need to encourage the knowledge and the code sharing that goes along with it, that it's really required to turn that data into knowledge and make decisions. Um, and lastly, definitely want to thank Deloitte, those AWS, and my Celgene colleagues. This was a holistic team effort um, in order to develop this platform, which has really allowed us to, to move forward as an organization. So with that, I did want to turn it over to Brad Bostic, who's the CEO of HC1, um, who's going to cover a customized CRM platform for healthcare organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, for joining. So HC1 focuses on understanding relationships and behaviors in healthcare so that we can drive positive change. And our overarching mission is really to be unlocking answers to healthcare's critical challenges. Today, we've been joined by one of those customers uh, who we work with in this way called North Memorial that I'll turn it over to shortly. But if you think about healthcare from a provider perspective, there are huge pressures today on not only reducing cost, but also increasing quality. And ultimately, that all comes down to how can I do a better job of managing patient populations? How can I do a better job of using information to create value? And really what is be, what's happening in healthcare is we're all becoming uh, aware of the fact that we're in the information business. And nobody generates more data in healthcare than laboratories. And so what we found is that when you can leverage the cloud and our healthcare relationship management platform together in a secure manner, you can start unlocking big value to do a better job of personalizing the way that healthcare services are delivered, ultimately do a better job of servicing the providers who are referring volume to your lab and get toward this future of healthcare that truly does start to see a decreased cost and increased quality. And we're coming from an environment where the data is extremely siloed. So much like uh, the Celgene speaker was talking about, you've got all these different disconnected data sets. That's what we really see in the healthcare provider environment as well. And so when you're trying to understand who the person is you're looking to engage and how you can more personally connect with them to drive a positive healthcare experience, it's difficult to do that. So what we're doing in the healthcare relationship management platform is automatically generating these holistic profiles that allow you to understand all these different people that you're interacting with and ultimately measure the way that you're serving them. Understand how much volume you're doing with a given provider, for example, and then understand what's going on with that provider's patient population and how you can deliver better service. Or if you have some kind of an issue that needs to be addressed, or let's say a critical value that's generated through the lab for a given individual patient, how do you automate all that engagement in a way that really brings a personalized experience that not only is providing a higher level of care, but it's done in a way that's more efficient so that you can decrease costs as well. 
One of the biggest challenges that exists in the healthcare environment is how do you focus on high value care and eliminate waste? And one area where there's a significant amount of opportunity to improve is with test and blood utilization. And you can see the stats on this slide here. It's estimated that somewhere in the range of a million and a half to two and a half, uh, 1.5 to two and a half billion, I should say, is wasted per year in the United States on inappropriate or unnecessary blood transfusions, which is not only a waste from a cost perspective, but it also can be dangerous when that's done in a way that's inappropriate or unnecessary. Uh, and then on top of that, there's somewhere in the range of 2.1 to 2.5 billion spent each year on unnecessary lab testing. So with that backdrop in mind, I'd like to turn it over to our client at North Memorial to talk through how they're taking test utilization into this new era of healthcare to, to provide higher value care and leveraging the partnership with HC1 and the cloud to make that happen. Hi there, um, I'm Michelle Custer. And I'm Patty Smith. And we both work at North Memorial Health Hospital in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. Uh, Patty is our system lab director now. We have a small system of two hospitals. Robbinsdale campus is a level one trauma center and Maple Grove is a community hospital. And then we have a couple of urgency centers and 17 or 18 clinic sites of which the lab is standardized now across all those fields. So with that, we will move on to our story. Uh, before we met up, up with HC1, we, as Brad already stated so well, we were data rich and insight poor. The laboratory generates volumes and volumes of information, um, not only from our instruments, but uh, we interface our LIS with the electronic health record of the customer that we're serving in the hospital and in our clinic sites. We have crystal reports. Uh, BOE, Zyphon is our billing platform. So we were kind of living in a sea of information, but we couldn't get at the data that we needed. So we were looking to partner with someone, and that's where we uh, became involved with HC1. So historically, as you all know, volume was rewarded. And if you look at the number of dollars spent on unnecessary lab tests, that's just kind of sad. Um, for all of us to note. And today we want to be rewarded with a value, with the value that we, we are providing instead of the volume. So moving on, our previous state then, if we were looking to find some information, we had to go about it in a systemic way. We had to request a report from our measurement and reporting department, and we would fall into a queue and someone in another department was looking at our request and prioritizing it with everyone else in the organization. So we pretty much sat and waited for that information to come back to us and finally something would show up and I know for myself something shows up and I forgot I even asked for it by the time it showed up. Uh, we would view the report and it may or may not contain the information that we had thought we were uh, looking for, so we'd have to go back and request additional information or revise our request. And again, it would fall back into that same old queue. So it was definitely not real time. And the report that we got was actually pretty much obsolete by the time it came to us. So that was not a helpful situation. So as Michelle stated, we um, were fortunate enough to start a relationship with hc1.com uh, and we started out with their customer relations module. So we have a large reference lab business and we have a customer service department. Uh, we service about 300 um, various um, clinic, nursing home, private practice, specialty care clinics for our reference lab. Our customer service reps would then take all of the calls that they'd receive from our reference lab clients and log them into HC1. Um, with that, then, we were able to trend um, 
varying issues if there were any. And we were also able to close any issues um, more timely than before. Um, before it would be get written down on a piece of paper and then they get routed to a supervisor or routed to a manager to try to resolve. And by the time that resolution would happen, you know, it could be three or four weeks and then, then you have an unhappy customer. And, and Patty, also now it's real time. I would get an email directly from customer service and I could immediately go to our Epic electronic record and research the, the situation and report back and find real answers for, the, for our customers right away. And so a lot of times, even with this, we're able to not only provide real-time data and close those issues right away, which then makes your customers and clientele happy, but a lot of times we were identifying concerns maybe even before our clients even knew about it. We looked good. <laughs> <laughs> so... Beyond the customer relations module that we started out with, we started looking at test utilization, and there's a separate package for that. So there's five categories that we identified, uh, and test utilization is something that we look at every year, and we're starting to have time to be able to access it more frequently, so it's going to be even more beneficial for our customers. So repetitive or duplicative testing, tests that don't need to be performed again and again, and even our techs are responsible for that in our in our clinical lab. They, they can see when there's a CBC and a hemoglobin ordered, and we're taking care of that on the back end for the customers. Um, the second one is high cost or unreimbursed testing. So those are tests that we're probably not gonna get reimbursed for, or someone's gonna deny it because they don't think that it's medically necessary because of the diagnosis code. That's one of them we're gonna be showing an example on today. The third one, obsolete or unproven tests ordered, tests that do not have added value to the clinical decision, um, or they shouldn't be ordered on this patient. Contraindicated screening and testing, those are conditions or circumstances that indicate a particular test should not be used in that case in question. A very simple um, thing to look at if you're paying attention, but sometimes those things are overlooked. And lastly, inappropriate tests by demographics. So that uh, uh, an easy example of that would be if we, we ask a question, if they order a malaria smear, has the patient been out of the country? So we don't want to be doing tests that there's absolutely no chance that they would be needing that diagnosis. And I'd like to add on to that too. Um, since we started the test utilization module in hc1.com, um, I think our utilization program has been developing over time. Um, as Michelle stated, we were looking at this um, annually um, and in bits and pieces. Um, now we're looking at it quarterly because we have the data available right at our fingertips and it's very easy to, to data mine. Um, that being said, we're still on a journey. Um, I would suggest to those out there that don't have a test utilization program even started, um, the number one thing to do is get leadership support. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a uh, medical director, or one of our pathologists being our medical director, who's very passionate about this. Um, and even our um, president, um, at one time, again, it was volume, volume, volume. You know, get mm -hmm. those, how many tests can you bring in, Patty? How many tests? How many clients can you bring in? And now he understands the importance of the medical necessity and doing the right tests at the right time. So, yeah, we're concerned about volume, but we're also concerned about that value and bringing that value back to our customers. That was our helicopter. Wow. <laughs> um so getting into some of our case studies, um, one of the first case studies that we did was um, I have a reference lab um, business office that's manned by our laboratory team. Um, so I'm able to work very closely with them. And they started seeing denials for um, a test called homocysteine. And we thought, well, that'd be a good place to start with test utilization. So what was happening is they were getting denials um, left and right, and so I was able to plug in 
um, homocysteine in, into HC1 and very easily and very quickly being able to drill down to see which clinics are ordering that test and then being able to drill down which providers are ordering the test, and even further drilling down to what diagnosis code were, were those providers using. So we were able to narrow down that the problem was happening with some of our cardiologists, um, and even with one or two doctors within the cardiology group. And what was happening is they were putting in a, um, and in, I guess I'd call it an invalid diagnosis code, which then the payers were coming back to us and saying, you know, this test then is, is investigational. So with the data that we received from HC1, we were able to meet with the cardiology medical director um, and share the information with him. And then they did some um, education with their providers. Um, they also contacted the, a couple of the payers um, that were denying the claims to have that conversation with them as well. And now, and for their practice, this was yep. definitely a medically necessary test. So yep. by changing the code, the, the test was covered and they did need this testing performed. And now we don't have the denials anymore. So that was a huge success story for us. Um, and we continue to look at our denial reports and run um, those tests through HC1. Right now we're looking at, we're getting a lot of denials on factor twos and factor fives um, from a couple of pairs. So we're gonna be diving into that data as well. All right, the next case study that we have then is under the category of obsolete or unproven test ordering. So the example that we have is the T4, T4 test. So best practice recommendations by endocrinologists has changed and the free T4 test is now a better indication of the clinical picture than the total T4 test. So we, we became aware of that information in our pathologists brought it forward and they wanted us to follow up on that. So they did some, some additional research and we went forward with trying to re remove that test from the platform as much as we could. And yet you all know if, if you're in the lab business, you can't ever really get rid of a lab test completely. You try to hide it as well as you can, but um, providers always find it and try to order it anyway. So, so we were working on that. So we were getting the practice moved over to a free T4 test. So what we did was we started out with an email to all of our providers and we told them what the story was, and we told them to please order a free T4 instead of the total T4. So then we monitored that on HC1, and we saw that there was a decline in the volume um, of that test ordering, so we were, we were happy with that. So then we kept looking at it, and we noted that it started to go back up again. So we were able to then send out another email communication, and saw a decline. And at that point, we ended up having some communications mm -hmm. with our chemistry section pathologist. And we did some one-on-one -on -one education between providers. And I know that physicians really do appreciate that. With HC1, then, we could look at the clinics, as Patty showed in the previous um, example, that we could find the clinics, we could find the doctor, and then we could go have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, which really promotes good relationships for our lab team with the people that are our customers out in the, out in the field. So we, we continue to monitor that too. And we've noted now that the practice is mainstream and there are really no more problems with this test because now it has caught on. And it's kind of a good game of telephone when new mm -hmm. people come on and then the older people that have had the experience know what the right thing is to do. So you kind of do see the bad tests move out of the way and, and you're done with it. But we can always keep an eye with HC1. So back to the fact that with us, we had to find data, wait for data, have someone analyze it, and then we'd try to affect change and then we'd get the new data and reanalyze that. It was sort of like rinsing and repeating until it was okay. 
which took a long time. And, and as I said before, personally, I kind of tend to forget about things that just kind of lose their steam. So with HC1, we, we've been able to build relationships using that platform. Uh, with the relationships, I think that's been a key to the success of our reference lab business. Um, we have greater visibility um, to all of our clients with HC1, and they appreciate that open communication and honest communication from us. Um, we often go out um, monthly or quarterly to meet with our clients, and we will pull reports um, right there in front of them um, from HC1 so they can see real time too what their data looks like. Um, even for test realization, um, I've gone on to um, certain clinics that have been curious as to provider versus provider within their own practice, mm -hmm. how their ordering practices are. Um, do they have one provider that's ordering, you know, willy nilly and every test under the sun? And do they have others that are doing more? specific medically necessary um, tests. So that's been very helpful um, to the practices as well. Um, I think also relationship building is um, strong between our pathology group and the providers and our clients as well. And Definitely. I know they appreciate that um, from a hospital lab specifically. So um, sustainability then. So we've been able to monitor that our ordering practice is now mainstream. We'll, we'll continue to mine for new projects and the factor two and five is kind of a new one. I didn't know about that. And that's mm -hmm. one of my, my babies in one of my areas of the lab. So I'm interested to know what's going on with that. Um, and we'll be able to identify these trends and uncover the data that we can use to make actionable items with and, and bring test utilization into a better picture for us. I think that's, yeah. Our last slide. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those examples. I think uh, both the life sciences and the healthcare story here is uh, are, are are excellent illustrations for how modern decision support tools can really advance business decision making in pharma in healthcare. So, thank you to all the speakers again for, for sharing your experience. We are getting a few questions in the question box, so let me get started uh, while we have the time. The first question comes for Patrick Clerch. Patrick, I'm gonna send it your way. And mm -hmm. the question is, how much of the data that you've talked about um, is on AWS? And how much is theoretically allowed to be on AWS? Yeah, so all of the data I discussed is on AWS. Um, it, it, it's a great question. I think from a, in terms of allowing data on AWS, it really does vary um, based on the legal agreements and what the patients are consented for. So when I walk through the platform, there's a there's a data request phase that is managed within the platform, and we do have data leads the way we've structured it that sit within the business. So when you the platform facilitates requests to get access to data that's on the platform, um, it's up to the data lead to determine um, if it can be ingested or um, if you can access it for the specific purpose you would like to access it for. Um, I think that. The caveat is in Europe, obviously, things are a little more complicated. Um, within Europe, we have a slightly different use of the platform. I think the U.S. instance tends to be um, sustained. The European instances, um, we are rapidly moving much towards being able to spin up platforms within a given country so that you can get access to the data within the country the analyst can analyze the data, we can remove the results and the platform can be spun back down. So within Europe, it's a much more dynamic instance and that's how we address the, the data uh, privacy and consent issues. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Dan, unless you want to add anything else, um, I'm going to move to the next question. 
And um, actually, let me synthesize here. There are a few questions that are coming in with the overarching theme of how do you build for compliance, including HIPAA, GXP, and other regulatory regimes. So um, let me uh, let me take a, a first first talk about the AWS services compliance, and then I'll hand over to Brad and to Dan to say a few words about how partners build compliance services on top of AWS. So AWS services uh, are HIPAA eligible. So, so when you think about both security and compliance on AWS, we build to the highest standard to uh, for, for the services to adhere to a large number of controls and control systems around the world. And that is, that is how services are, that are built on AWS are classified as HIPAA eligible. So, so we follow the shared responsibility model in which ultimately the customer and the partner are responsible for building HIPAA compliant uh, applications with our HIPAA eligible services. Brad, uh, do you want to say a few words for how the HC1 platform is built? Sure, yeah. So AWS actually identifies each of the services that are covered under the BAA, the Business Associates Agreement, that is in place. So uh, actually all of the uh, legal uh, compliance is built into the service from a healthcare perspective. And so what we do then is actually only use those services that are covered under the BAA, are HIPAA compliant, and then actually go above and beyond of what HIPAA actually requires. So all the data is encrypted at rest and in transit and on um, basically using the most advanced security uh, protocols. So we, we find it's uh, much more secure than what the traditional on-premise approach has been with much of healthcare IT. And then on top of that, AWS does provide the option to become uh, certified as a healthcare competency provider, which means that AWS and HC1 go through a, a very exhaustive audit process and uh, all the different testing is done to ensure that you are uh, really up to the, the highest standards for the purposes of, of protecting sensitive information and, and making sure that that's secure. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Dan, is... Dan, would you like to add your perspective? Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind, in a lot of the cases with real-world data, um, while HIP is an important set of controls, um, we're dealing with anonymized or pseudonymized data sets, so we don't have direct access to PHI in the solutions that we're talking about. Most of the data sets aren't in that structure. Um, but at the same time, we do have cases where there are needs for advanced controls within the systems that are inside a miner. Um, in particular, we deal with clinical trial data sets that have GXP compliance requirements, um, as well as at times we'll, we'll bring in data sets that have enough identifiers that HIPAA becomes the, the control set that we're using to, to manage for compliance. And the way we've handled it at Deloitte is, um, on the one hand, we have um, a cloud framework we've put together so that we can host within our virtual infrastructure on top of the AWS infrastructure, that's the Deloitte Life Sciences Cloud, so that um, an organization that's one of our Life Sciences clients doesn't have to stand up all the different pieces and functions that would allow them to, to meet the GXP or the HIPAA requirements. Um, but we also offer uh, within our team both the similar tools to pre-certify within the packages we put together. Um, especially for relevant components. You know, for example, we have a clinical data repository that we put together that could be something you'd use to, to manage clinical data for GXP, um, such that someone can use that package and then not have to redo all the certification, as well as teams, because we are involved in, in doing GXP compliance certification support and services. We offer the consulting help to help internal teams within their own information technology infrastructure to, to put the, the systems in place, the controls in place to get them certified so they can then be used for those purposes. Um, so it's a pretty big piece 
in standing up a lot of different systems. I'd say it's not as big of a piece within the real world data, real world evidence space historically, um, which is one of the reasons why people start off with that as one of the major data sets they want to bring on board um, because it has a little bit less um, compliance con constraints and complexity than, than some of these other areas. Thank you, Dan. Um, another question that came in, uh, and I'll just take that one real quick, uh, was it relates to GDPR compliance. And I'll just mention that the same principles apply. And as far as the AWS services cons are concerned, we are ready for uh, GDPR compliance. So the tools, the guidances are available on our website. So by May 25, everybody should be able to, to implement their um, GDPR architectures, GDPR compliant architectures, and uh, certainly you can reach out to our teams. We can follow up on on giving you getting you additional guidance. Um, just to pick up, so Dan mentioned the approach to data de-identification on uh, the Deloitte side, on the life sciences side. Similar question came in: Was there a need to de-identify the data before sending it to the cloud uh, for? Um, for the healthcare scenario, uh, Brad or Michelle, anybody uh, wants to take that yeah, question? Yeah, so yeah, I can I can speak to that. So the um, uh, business associates agreement covers the ability to utilize the AWS platform uh, to address all the security requirements to allow this data set to contain PHI. So it is up to and beyond the standards of what are required by HIPAA. And, uh, it, and actually, in a lot of the cases, it's been pretty eye-opening where you've had chief security officers dig in on the approach that's used between both HC1 and AWS uh, that you find people saying, wow, we should do some of that internally on some of the things that we're securing. So uh, we we have found that the level of security is beyond what's satisfactory, not only in North America, but also in the business that we're doing in Europe. Uh, that sounds great. And Brad, while we have you, we have another question for you. And that is, could HC1 integrate other types of healthcare data? Absolutely. We view the real need in healthcare as one of constructing the richest possible set of interconnected profiles that you can develop such that you can really determine how best to drive positive change. So it's very common within the arrangements that we have and partnerships that we have with clients, uh, in, including North Memorial, where you might start in one area that uh, that requires a certain type of data, and then you can expand into many different areas. And we're even getting into the level in some relationships where not only are we looking at traditional healthcare information, but we're also starting to overlay things like behavioral data and uh, understand, you know, better understanding the uh, social determinants of health and the, the things that really come together to paint that entire picture of what's going to give people the best, healthiest, longest life. Uh, all of it really is is fair game and can be integrated into the platform. Thank you. Um, another question for Michelle and Patty. Uh, a couple of questions actually, so so let me bundle them up for you. Uh, first question is, how long did it take to implement HC1? And the second question, um, for North Memorial, what kind of advice could you provide to gain executive support to implement HC1 to drive value-added services for physicians? Sure. I, I get that question a lot on, on how long did it take um, for that connectivity to happen. And I know there's always a concern for uh, laboratorians and hospitals, at least, that how much time does it take for my own hospital IT department? How much involvement is in there? Um, it did not take long at all. I think, if I remember right, it took, you know, maybe three to four months. Um, and our IT department, of course, was involved. But the, the IT team at HC1.com did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and they were Truthfully, and I'm not just saying this because Brad's on the phone. Um, <laughs> truthfully, they were great partners to work with. 
Um, they were very understanding. They were very knowledgeable. Um, they had done this, you know, multiple times before. So they, their process um, of implementation was was spot on and very seamless. Um, and then your second question, um, how to gain executive support. You know, I think more and more executives should be um, looking at healthcare in, in general right now because we are truly moving to that value-based service versus volume-based. Um, and fortunately, my um, president was knowledgeable about that um, because we don't want a high denial rate where we're not getting payment because people aren't ordering the right tests at the right time because then my revenue stream tanks. Um, so he truthfully understands um, the importance of test utilization um, and getting that coded correctly and getting those payments in the door. Um, and then, like I said before, too, I'm very fortunate to have a um, pathologist that's very passionate about this, too, and she's highly respected um, within our organization as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, executive buy-in and including both business line executives and uh, senior compliance executives is something that we're certainly seeing as some of the best practices for initiating new projects and, and larger initiatives as well. Another question that has come in, um, and looks like we only have time for one or two more, uh, there's a question about blockchain. What role will blockchain play? in data access rights management involving patient-owned data on AWS. Um, that, that's actually an area where we are experimenting very actively with partners and customers. So uh, perhaps that one we can take separately, but in the meantime, you may want to check out some of the presentations, um, even going back to the last reInvent when we talk about the use of blockchain and healthcare. And um, yeah, we'll follow up with you offline. Uh, there is I mean, also I, Oksana, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'd give a quick, quick answer about sure. you know, because blockchain yeah, has this ability to do a shared um, shared ledger, and there is this big question which comes about when we're doing analytics off of data sets that sort of are moving out of the hands of different groups that that have low trust. Um, there is this application that we're looking into around just general providence of what happened to my data and build some tracking systems that go downstream into the analytics that we have put into tools like Miner. We certainly aren't ready to d deploy such a system, but I think the one of the major places to put in blockchain as a, a tool, because you know, a lot of the use cases that come out are sort of supply chain or tracking events over time, is to track the events that occur to data over multiple stages to create analytical results to deal with the providence of source to and analysis. Fabulous. Thank, thank you, Dan, for the added color. Um, I am looking at the clock. We're at the top of the hour. It's, uh, so we're going to have to wrap up here. Thank you, everyone who participated. We have uh, a lot of quality questions, and we're going to be getting back to you. So thank you for attending the webinar today. Please remember to stay connected and complete a brief survey at the conclusion of the webinar. We truly appreciate your feedback, and thanks again to all the speakers, partners, customers who came on board and told your stories. Uh, really appreciate it, and I think the amount of response really reflects the importance of this topic to our industry. So thanks again, and we'll be following up and talk to you again soon.